Look, I'm sure you've heard about it. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Bitcoins. Meantime, another 52 week high for Bitcoin. Well, what does it all mean? You see, this isn't going to be the most entertaining video here on YouTube, but I assure you, this is going to be one of the most important videos that you'll ever watch because this here is going to be the one and only guide for you to get a complete full rundown to take you from being someone who might not know much about crypto to even one day becoming a possible crypto millionaire from the foundations of what you'll learn here today. Now, look, when I first invested my own money into Bitcoin, I was just 20 years old living with my parents. And at that time, I was your typical broke student attending my local community college working two part-time jobs now one of those jobs i was doing hardwood floors with my dad who was a contractor and the other job i was working with children who had autism as a health technician in between my hours at work i still remember the days where i decided to invest the little money i was earning at that time into buying up some bitcoin since then throughout my entire journey i've been able to make millions but i've also lost near millions too and if there's one thing that i regret and look back on now it's wishing i had learned and knew all the things that i'm I'm going to be sharing with you in this video here today. So ladies and gents, this year is going to be a much longer video because I'm essentially transferring my near decade worth of knowledge and experience into one jam packed guide. Now, if you want to go ahead and get the most amount out of this video, I suggest that you find a way to take notes as we go along and follow along with an exchange of your choice. With all that being said, here's what we're going to be going over for today. I'm also going to go ahead and put some chapter timestamps down below in the description of this video. If you guys want to go ahead and skip to any other parts of this video to give you an even further breakdown. Here's what we'll be covering though today. So first we're going to have an introduction. And in this, I'm going to be covering why now is more important than ever before for you to be paying attention to crypto today. I'm also going to be explaining what the basics of crypto and all the key terms are such as blockchain, proof of stake versus proof of work and the benefits of what crypto was created for. I'll then go over all the different ways that you can make money from crypto and what I believe is the best in today's day of age. We'll then be going over all the risks of crypto and how you can protect yourself from any type of scams or malicious activity because crypto, yes, it's the wild, wild west and there's a lot of crazy stuff happening, but there are ways that you can go ahead and protect yourself so it doesn't happen to you. From there, I'll be going over all the different types of crypto and all the most used terminologies. So if someone ever asks you about price action, fundamentals, DeFi products, you'll know exactly what they're talking about and how to respond. We're then going to be talking about how you can buy, trade and store your crypto safely through the use of different cold and hot storage wallets. I'll also show you step by step in what I believe is the best way for you to buy crypto securely and safely. After that, I'll also be going over how to research cryptocurrencies properly so that you can set yourself up for the best chances of success as an investor. Next, I'll go over how you can build your own balanced crypto portfolio, depending on the risk level of your choice. And then I'll also go over everything you need to know about crypto taxes, because this year is also another complicated topic. And if you're on your way to making millions one day, I want to make sure that you don't ever overpay or underpay on the taxes due. Now, towards the end, I'm going to give you five of my biggest lessons to help you get started in the safest and most efficient way possible. Now, last but not least, I'm going to go over all the different crypto plays and narratives for the upcoming bull run so that you have a direction of where you can now apply all this new knowledge you're going to learn so you don't miss out on what's to Come. So to kick this off, why should you even learn or decide to invest your money into crypto? Well, the first and most obvious reason is the potential for high returns. If you learn and understand how the crypto markets move, you have the opportunity to make life changing money if you're patient enough and put in the work. Now, I truly believe that crypto has the power to do that, and it has the power to transfer wealth from the ultra wealthy to everyday people like you and I. And it just starts with taking some time to learn the basics. Now, on top of that, the overall crypto market cap is also down significantly, which means that that cryptocurrencies are still at a discount. Look, it'd be a whole different story if I told you Let's invest while Bitcoin was still at $69,000. In my right mind, I would not know if I could say that this is going to be the best time to invest, but I at least know within the time of filming this video, we are down still a significant amount from where we were before. And even right now, behind the narrative of cryptocurrency continue to expand is still rising up. Crypto is still also in its infancy. And right now you have a chance of being at the forefront of a potentially transformative wave between technology and finance. A lot of people have tend to forget that Bitcoin was only created about 14 years back, and there's so much room for improvement, adoption, and even more positive outlooks. In the last 14 years, Bitcoin has grown tremendously. I'm also going to be going over a crypto calculator to just show you if you had invested even a hundred or a thousand dollars into Bitcoin when it first came out, how much that would be worth. Last but not least, crypto right now is still what I believe is the future. Governments are actively looking into crypto laws, regulations, and even things like CBDCs. Now, CBDC is a central 
federal bank digital currency, where one day in the future, the government might decide to come out with their own cryptocurrency after they realize just how powerful this entire market is. At this time, companies and institutions are still learning, investing, and implementing blockchain technology into their business. We've had other countries like El Salvador making them legal tender, and people right now are waking up to the limitations of fiat currency and the bad that can come with it. Not only that, but I'd say crypto is now starting to go a bit more mainstream. It's going to be more common for you to hear crypto on the news. If you're watching your favorite football team, you'll see like a crypto exchange pop up or even just people at your work or people that you go to school with talking about different cryptocurrencies. Now, I want to show you something interesting here. If you were to dollar cost average just $10 into the markets since 2020 between gold, Bitcoin, the S&P 500, treasury bonds, and the NASDAQ, according to this graph, your Bitcoin would be up over 100%, while the NASDAQ is up only 28%, the S&P 500 up only 18%, gold up 16%, and the US treasury bonds, well, you'd actually be down 20%, accounting for inflation as well. Now, it's pretty clear, judging from even the past few years, that Bitcoin has been a strong contender as an investment. But let me actually show you what the exact numbers are. So as an example, say you had bought Bitcoin for $1,000 in 2010. If I were to go ahead and calculate this, that would be worth over $215 million. Now, 2010 was a long time ago, but say we did something else. Let's do January of 2020 and say I'd invested $10,000. Now, 2020 was not too long ago. And if I had bought in at that time, Bitcoin's price would have been at $8,600 with the current price of it being at over $43,000 at the time of filming this video, I would have made a profit of over 400% and have had brought up my capital to 50,515 bucks. Just to show you some evidence historically, Bitcoin back before 2010 was sitting at under a dollar. It was a year later where Bitcoin hit $5. A year after that, it went up to $100. And then the next year, we saw it at $457. In 2014, Bitcoin drew back down to $244. And since then, we've seen Bitcoin Bitcoin grow at a pretty astronomical rate. What I've realized within the last few years of seeing many investors come and go within the crypto space is that people want to make quick money fast. I'm sure 90% of you out here have heard about things like Dogecoin, Pepe coin, and all these other memes. Now we'll go over exactly why that came about and why they performed the way they did later on. But the main focus I want to reiterate is just the importance of proper basic investing and having a long-term vision on the horizon. Now, look, I might be getting ahead of myself already talking about investing and how much money you can make. Let's back up just a little bit to talk about what cryptocurrency is as a beginner. So what is cryptocurrency? Well, by definition, a cryptocurrency is a digital currency, which is an alternative form of payment created using encryption algorithms. The use of encryption technologies mean that cryptocurrencies function both as a currency and as a virtual accounting system. Crypto is generally use in a wide variety of different applications, such as buying goods and services, trading, and peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Now, if that went over your head, that's completely okay, because the literal definition of this can be rather daunting for anyone new to the market. But the way I like to explain it, and what I think is the easiest to understand, is just think of crypto as if it's PayPal, Venmo, or Zelle, where there is no company in the middle between that exchange. So say you're going out to dinner with six of your friends, and you get a giant food bill. Normally, you would go ahead and split that bill with all these different credit cards. But sometimes there's a restaurant that could say, sorry, we're only going to accept just one credit card. If that's the case, then you would put it down on your card and you would tell all your friends to Venmo you or Zell you. And in this case, where someone is able to just input your username or your phone number or your email address and send you money in that capacity, that right there is very similar to the basic understanding of crypto, more specifically, even with the creation of Bitcoin. Now, when you're using Venmo, your money gets sent over to Venmo, then Venmo actually has it sent over you. When it comes to crypto, you're taking out that middleman and the transaction goes straight over directly to you. Now to send someone money through crypto, it's actually very simple. You can do this on any basic exchange or even if you have a hot wallet or a cold storage wallet and all you have to do is copy and paste a string of random letters and numbers. Unlike Venmo or PayPal where you have people's usernames and email addresses that are tied to their identity, crypto wallet addresses are generally anonymous where it looks like if you had just like smashed your head on a keyboard, that's what the wallet address would look like. So knowing all that, 
Why is crypto so important today? What are the problems that crypto is mainly solving? Well, cryptocurrency has gained popularity in today's world because it has so much potential in solving complex and large issues in our financial economy and our government controlled society. One of the narratives behind crypto is the fact that this is a strong hedge against inflation. No matter where you live right now, most countries have gone through extreme amounts of inflation because of the pandemic that we went through and the amount of money printing that we saw happen on the government level. Even in the US, we reached a 40 year high inflation rate last year when we peaked at 9.1% back in June. Now this year happened because the government was simply able to print as much money as they wanted. Remember that meme with Jerome Powell and the printer? That's what it's about. When it comes to crypto, no one has access to a money printing machine. The federal government or any large entity can't come in and just be like, okay, let's start printing trillions and trillions of dollars. Because crypto is also not considered to be fiat and instead it's a different type of currency where it's self-regulated. People often see that as an alternative use to modern day currency, like even the dollar. Now, all the money printing led to a higher inflation rate, which was combated by the higher interest rate that the government started pushing out. The Interest rate has now led to the borrowing of money getting much more expensive. So for me, I was getting a mortgage on my house. And back then when I was looking during the pandemic, the interest rate was like 3%. So my mortgage at that time was like $6,000 a month. By the time my house was finished getting built and I had looked at the interest rate again, it was at over 5%. So my monthly mortgage, which was at $6,000 a month, it had moved up to about eight to $9,000 a month. Even auto loans right now, back then you can get some cars with 0% interest on your auto loan. But now I'm seeing even rates of anywhere from five to 7% if you do decide that you wanna go ahead and buy a vehicle and finance it. So through the rise of interest rates, a lot of these banks actually couldn't keep up because one of the ways that banks can stay in business is through the amount of money that they get from you where you hold it in their checking account. And from there, they would be able to earn interest on that amount. Now, since interest rates were rising up for the amount of money that was getting loaned out, we actually saw a lot of banks starting to collapse. First Republic Bank, Silvergate Bank. I mean, these are just a few and eventually the government had to go ahead and bail them out. Last but not least, crypto offers security and transparency. This is because everything is recorded on something called a public ledger. This is how blockchain technology works. And this year can lead to reduced fraud and corruption, especially in systems that are prone to human error or manipulation. Now that leads into what actually is Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is like the umbrella term for all the different cryptos that exist today. Now, Bitcoin was actually the first crypto to ever be created. And it was made in 2008 by an unknown person or group using the name Satoshi Nakamoto. Bitcoin was also initially created to be an electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash system. But it turns out that it also attracted many investors as a store of value currency. Bitcoin at the moment is still the largest cryptocurrency and it makes up roughly 50% of the entire crypto market cap. The reason why people love Bitcoin too is that everything is open source. This means the code and everything that makes what Bitcoin is today is fully available and open for the public to see. Now, even going on Bitcoin.org, you can pull up something called a white paper. Now, all cryptocurrencies have this. Your white paper is going to give you a full rundown of what the crypto was created for, the details of it. It's going to introduce it. Sometimes it mentions its team, how it works, the mechanics behind it. And if you're someone who really needs to understand exactly the logistics of how the technicalities may work, this is something that you may want to look into as well. Now, Bitcoin operates on a decentralized system called the blockchain, which is just a fancy term for a public and digital ledger that records all Bitcoin transactions. Now, the reason the blockchain is groundbreaking technology when it was first released is because the transactions are recorded in a secure and permanent manner that everyone has access to. This means that even with something like Bitcoin, where a lot of TV shows portray Bitcoin to be like this anonymous crypto thing, where people are like, oh, you want to go ahead and buy these drugs using Bitcoin? It often doesn't make sense because everything is recorded onto the blockchain, which is made public. And then if you can find someone's wallet address, you can see all of their different history and spend. Now, the blockchain is truly fascinating stuff and it is real. If you go on even something like blockchain.com, you can go ahead and search up the latest transactions. As an example, with here, I can see the Bitcoin mempool. I can see details of different transactions, the cost of it, because the cost does go up and down throughout different times of when demand starts rising for the use case of Bitcoin. But all of these unconfirmed Bitcoin transactions that are still actively coming in are real people from all over the world that are sending transactions from one wallet to another. So if I click on a random transaction, I can go ahead and see who sent it, 
who received it, and all the details, including the fee of how much money it costs right now to actually send that Bitcoin. Now, going back to the example we used earlier in Venmo and Zelle, where you send someone money, usually that's free. But when you're using Bitcoin, you do need to pay a small flat fee. This can range from a couple bucks all the way up to 20 or even 30 bucks, depending on how much Bitcoin you're sending to someone. The reason you pay this amount is because that actually goes to the people that are mining the Bitcoin that allow for the transaction to get processed. Now, the transaction in the creation of Bitcoin is done through a process called Bitcoin mining, which is almost like a digital version of mining for gold, where instead of physical mining, you actually have computers that solve complex math problems that validate and then secure those transactions that we saw on the blockchain. Now, when these problems are solved, a new block is added onto the blockchain and the miner is then issued with a new Bitcoin as a reward for adding a new transaction to Bitcoin's public ledger. This method of validating transactions, securing the network and creating new tokens through these math computations is what we call proof of work. If you've ever heard complaints about crypto from the environmental enthusiast crowd and people who are concerned about global warming, the proof of work method is essentially what they're protesting. In order to mine Bitcoin, you need computers. And not just that, you need computers that require a high amount of electricity and power. Obviously, electricity is not for free unless you're going completely solar, which is not the case for many people across the world. Now, the reason why proof of work is so energy intensive is because all all these Bitcoin miners are also essentially competing with one another, trying to solve the computations first and validate the transactions before others. For example, at any given time, there isn't just one Bitcoin miner somewhere in the world that's working. There may be hundreds, if not thousands of different Bitcoin miners all working on the same math problem. Now, every miner here is going to be using a ton of power and energy, but only one of them will win and get rewarded a Bitcoin, which then means the other nine miners wasted all that energy for nothing in return. Now, this this process can seem like it's inefficient. And to be honest, the more competition in the Bitcoin mining space, the more energy that will be used. And as time goes on, it's going to get even more difficult in mining Bitcoin. So the proof of work system has always been seen to be as like the old school way of getting things done. Now, it's not the only way for cryptocurrencies to be able to process transactions, but the new way and the more eco-friendly alternative that we see a lot of these other altcoins adopting is through the proof of stake method. Now, the proof of stake is another consensus mechanism used in crypto networks to validate transactions and add new blocks to the blockchain. This year functions more like a lottery system, where essentially instead of using computing power to solve complex puzzles, like in the proof of work system, users who own some of the network's cryptocurrencies can stake their coins, which means locking them up as a form of security deposit. And then the system then randomly chooses these stakers to check and add new transactions to the blockchain. Now, the most notable proof of stake example occurred between the second largest cryptocurrency in the world, and that is Ethereum, where back in 2022, Ethereum used to be proof of work. Then they decided to move over into proof of stake. And once that had gone into effect, Ethereum tokens were considered to be 99.9% .9 more energy efficient among several other positive benefits happening to the Ethereum project and ecosystem. Now, the cool part here is anyone with a small amount of cryptocurrency can participate in staking and the rewards might be even higher for those with the bigger investment. But the roadblock to getting started are much lower than with proof of work cryptocurrencies. We'll talk more about how you can make some additional passive income with staking. I'll show you how much money I've made from staking my own crypto, but it is definitely an alternative way for you to earn what I consider to be additional interest on your investment that you have. So here on your screen, you can go ahead and see the pros and the cons between proof of work and proof of stake. All right. So at this point, you should have a better understanding of how cryptocurrencies like even Bitcoin and Ethereum work. With that said, let's go over a a little bit more exciting stuff, which is four ways that you can actually make money from crypto. So the first and most obvious way to make money with crypto is by using it as an investment vehicle, similar to how you would with a stock. In this case, you would buy the crypto and over time, the value appreciates and you can go ahead and lock in profits. So an example of this is putting $100 into Bitcoin when its price is at $10,000. By the way, you can always buy fractions of Bitcoin. You do not have to buy a whole Bitcoin every single time. If you held that amount and Bitcoin had hit $69,000 like it did in the previous bull run, 
then whatever the amount was at that time where you sell your Bitcoin would be the amount of US dollars you get back. Now, the second way you can make money from crypto is something we just talked about. That's crypto staking. And I'll show you guys within my own portfolio using Coinbase, how much I have money even just in the last few years. For this, I just want to mention that it depends on the crypto on how much you can earn. But generally, I've seen people earn anywhere from three to even 15 percent back, depending on the coin. Now, the third way you can make money through crypto is through crypto mining. This here is where you go ahead and buy computer gear. You turn on a crypto mining software and your computer is then going ahead and trying to capitalize on the proof of stake consensus model that we just talked about. Fourth way you can make money from crypto is through something called DeFi. So DeFi, otherwise known as decentralized finance, what it's short for, allows you to do various amounts of things such as earning interest or allowing someone to borrow your crypto and paying you some money on that. You can go ahead and even lend out your crypto and with a smart contract that's written up, if someone pays you back on time, they still have to pay you interest or if they don't pay you back on time, you can be making a whole lot more. Out of all these things, I think crypto DeFi is the one that we need to expand upon just because there's a lot of different ways you can go about this. As you see on your screen here, if you were to ever get money from the bank, as if I was getting a mortgage from my home, I had to go through a huge, huge process where they were going through all my tax returns, my bank accounts, they were going and asking for statements and verifying all this information, then going through my credit score, which also measures how often I'm paying off the people that I owe my debts to. Traditional lending can take a whole lot of time. Even after going through a long and tedious process, banks can then say no to you and say, we don't want to lend you the money. Now, when it comes to DeFi lending or borrowing money through cryptocurrency, you don't need to go through all the risk protocols that you would with traditional finance. So I could skip the credit score. I could skip sending all my sensitive information like the tax returns, the bank statements. And instead, I can hop on to a website, connect my wallet address, sign a smart contract where I can go ahead and access money using a variety of different DeFi tools. So the top DeFi lending platforms right now, Compound, Aave, Uniswap, MakerDAO is pretty good. Let me show you Aave as a quick example. So Aave is a cryptocurrency itself. The more this token is used, generally the higher the price begins to go. In the bull run, Aave was doing pretty well. And here on this website, you can see some of the details where they even state just earn interest, borrow assets, and build applications where they now have $9 billion of liquidity locked in Aave across eight networks and over 15 markets. Scrolling down with any cryptocurrency, you could generally see how they work. To go ahead and actually use it, go ahead and launch the app. From here, you want to go ahead and connect a wallet. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and load up something called a hot wallet. We'll talk about the details of that later, but essentially this is just like a free profile wallet that you can go ahead and create. I use MetaMask and here is where I can now begin to use different tools on Aave. If I want to go ahead and stake Aave, it'll tell me how much I can earn back. Now, if I need to go ahead and borrow some money, there's going to be a wide variety of different assets I can choose from. One of the requirements though, for you to be able to borrow money is to be able to put down an asset as collateral. So if you have no money, it's going to be hard to get free money coming in as a loan, just because you'd be high risk. And if you end up defaulting on that, there wouldn't be anything that you would pay back or reimburse the network for. Another example, of a very popular DeFi protocol is something called Uniswap. This year is a decentralized crypto trading protocol. This year almost acts as if it's an exchange, except it's not centralized. What Uniswap is really good for is if you've ever heard of those certain altcoins where you're like, where in the world can I buy PayPay version two monkey token? They're usually listed here on these decentralized exchanges first. To do anything, you generally need Ethereum. And this is why I'm so bullish on Ethereum too, because any DeFi protocol that you use, or even getting into the NFT space requires for you to use Ethereum rather than Bitcoin. So what you would do is get Ethereum, send it over to a MetaMask wallet that you have. You then go ahead and connect your MetaMask wallet. And then from here, you could swap that for any one of these tokens. Now, if a random token here ends up popping off and it goes like up 3000%, this is where people would then be able to start making money. It's from there where you choose that token and then you could resell it for the Ethereum and then move that back into your wallet and then offload it from a crypto exchange back into your bank account. So those are going to be some additional ways that you can make money through DeFi. There are going to be two more ways, and this is going to be through yield farming and airdrops. Now, yield farming allows for investors to earn yield by putting coins or tokens in a decentralized application. Yield farming is going to be a lot more higher risk, but there is going to be a higher potential in return. I've seen some yield farming sites where they offer you 2000% interest back on your crypto, but the downside is going to be the fact that that crypto is so volatile volatile and there's really no value behind it where you end up losing your money anyways because the actual value of the
the currency drops so much. Now, airdrops is another cool way for you to make money. This here is completely free, where usually if a crypto project is starting up, a way for some of these newer projects to go ahead and reward their investors or people who are just supporters of the token is through airdropping into their wallet address a fixed amount. Now, I have some people who love taking advantage of airdrops just because you do not have to put up any money and all it requires is for your time in communicating and engaging and just spending some time within forums, communities, and Discord chats. Out of all of those ways, though, that we've mentioned, everything has its own risk. The biggest risk when it comes to crypto trading is the fact that if you buy it at the all-time high price and you decide to sell when it goes down, you're going to be losing money. There's also going to be thousands of different coins. There's going to be thousands more popping up, and sometimes they are considered to be something called a rug pull, where literally, like the owner of that crypto, they code it up, uh, they copy and paste it from another credible project, and they go ahead, they get people to buy in, and then they sell all their positions where people are then left holding the token. That is a term that you may hear where someone is holding the bag. Now, the term rug pull is just the fact that if someone buys in and you pretty much take the money out from underneath their feet, that's what rug pull is. It sounds like what it is. When it comes to even things like staking your crypto, there are also additional associated risks. Some cryptos, if you go ahead and stake it, you cannot unstake it until a certain amount of time has passed. For the most part, I've seen less and less cryptos that require a certain holding time. But what I have seen is if you want to earn even more interest, you do then lock it up. For me personally, I never like locking up my tokens in the case that I need to liquidate it very fast. So anything I stake, I make sure I read the conditions to see if I can unstake it in within at least a day. What I just talked about here is called soft staking. And essentially, you're just allowed to unstake your crypto at any time. Now, we talked about crypto mining earlier. And if any of you guys have considered doing that, I'd say it's pretty easy in getting started. But profit margins are going to be thin. Most people are not able to make money because equipment and cost of electricity is still rising. And right now there's more competition. So the payouts are getting much more difficult for you to win on. On your screen here is just a picture. I wanted to show you where this Bitcoin mining facility in Iceland is actually using more electricity than all the homes on its island. So this here just shows you how serious and well-equipped the competition really is. Now we've just gone some of the general risks when it comes to making money with crypto, but I wanted to go over the broader risks with the crypto market and also go over some of the most important practices to make sure that you stay safe and secure. Now, according to chain analysis, 2022 was the biggest year ever for crypto hacking with $3.8 billion gone. Now I've heard from many different people, other influencers, companies that have constantly get scammed and what I need to say is that you need to make sure that you are protected. To amp up your security, what I'd recommend is using a VPN. I've personally been using something like Surfshark for many, many years, but you guys can use any VPN of your choice. I also go ahead and make sure I use a cold storage wallet. Now we'll cover these in a future chapter, but essentially this is gonna be a way for you to make your crypto portfolio close to impossible to hack. To prevent getting scammed, also make sure that you only click on links that you recognize, only use reputable and well-known services, and know that that crypto influencers will not be reaching out to you and DMing you. One issue I've seen in the past few years before I was able to get my accounts verified was a lot of people impersonating me saying, oh, message me here on WhatsApp. And then my viewers would go ahead and send them money and then say, Brian, we sent you money, but it wasn't me. They sent it to a hacker who was impersonating me. And it was just a whole big headache. If at any time you think I followed you back on Instagram or Twitter, please verify that it's my actual account. This goes for any influencer. If you see Michael Saylor randomly followed your account or some crypto influence that, that you followed, and then all of a sudden he followed you back, chances are they probably didn't. Go ahead and make sure that it's their real account because fraud accounts and impersonations are still on the rise. Now, one of the broader risks that I've seen developing within the last few years is also just the fact that crypto is still going through a ton of unclarity between rules and regulations. Government agencies like the SEC are constantly attacking crypto companies and issuing out new lawsuits claiming that many crypto projects are unregistered securities. Now this here can directly impact the value of your holdings if you own that crypto. Even aside from that, the SEC going after projects and tokens affects the entire space because investors become less confident in wanting to invest into a space that is getting more and more regulated. Now I'm personally someone who believes that 
that regulation is actually very good for the space. But I also think there's a big difference between putting regulation versus fear and rules that are unjustified. Now, we've also witnessed some of the most prominent crypto projects, exchanges, and companies go bankrupt or insolvent. This year resulted in many people losing their funds, and it really showed how little transparency was actually happening within companies in a ironic space of crypto where transparency is supposed to be the biggest factor behind what makes up this space. While there have been a few bad actors involved, these few actors have collectively caused so much damage that it made the entire crypto industry look bad in whole. To mitigate this risk, I recommend that you do as much research as possible before trusting any project or service with your funds. Personally, for me, I use Coinbase and any FDIC protected exchange. Now, last but not least, while the market within crypto can be volatile, there are also instances where there are some projects that are straight up Scams. The one that caught most people off guard was Terra Luna. This year resulted in the founder of Terra Luna being on the run, and it led to one of the craziest moments during the previous drawdown of the bull market. Now, look, whenever the crypto bull market comes about next, I guarantee that we're going to be seeing even more scams rising up. This here seems to be inevitable, but you can go ahead and protect yourself by making sure that you at least do your due diligence from some of the research methods that we're going to be talking about soon. Moving forward, as a reminder, go ahead and protect yourself. So go ahead and use a trusted password manager. I personally like using something called 1Pass. You can use things like LastPass 2, where this will be a vault for new generated passwords on every account that you make. The second tip is to write your keys down and store them in an encrypted file offline. Anytime you keep something on your computer or digital you're at risk of if someone hacking you still getting access to it. One of the safest measure actually turns out if you write down your seed phrase on a piece of paper and you put that in a secure place, maybe you got a vault, maybe you have uh, one of those little vault rigs at a bank account that you're paying $5 a month for, that could be a huge way for you to protect yourself. That right there is going to increase the amount of security that you have for yourself. The following on this list are ones that I just covered, but if you want to take a chance to pause this video and look at it, you can go ahead and do that now. Moving on, we are now in chapter three, where we are now going to cover the crypto types and terminologies. Now, in the stock market, investors categorize different stocks with terms like dividend stocks, value stocks, growth stocks, tech stocks, finance stocks, and more. When it comes to crypto, we have our own categories and terms. This year is going to be your altcoins, your stable coins, exchange tokens, meme coins, metaverse tokens, NFTs, and more. So to start out, altcoins are going to be the biggest term that you're going to hear. Now, altcoin is very simple. This is going to be any alternative cryptocurrency other than Bitcoin. Some of the most prominent altcoins that exist are going to be Ethereum, XRP, Solana, Cardano, and more. Pretty much if you go on coinmarketcap.com, all the cryptocurrencies that you see aside from Bitcoin and stable coins are going to be altcoins. Now, stable coins here are cryptocurrencies that are pegged to the value of another asset. An example of this is going to be like USDT or USDT. DC. A lot of newer investors assume that if you have cash and you load it up to an exchange, then you can buy Bitcoin directly. Nowadays, exchanges are making it easier. So yes, that is indeed the case. But a few years back too, in order for you to go ahead and buy an altcoin or even Bitcoin, you would need to go ahead and buy a stable coin first. Now, because these stable coins are pegged to the value of a dollar, it should always be one to one. Sometimes you're going to see that the stable coin is 96 cents or 94 cents if things are getting a little bit more rocky, but generally it should always be very close to the value of $1. Now in the crypto crash of 2022, one of the largest stable coins at the time, Terra USD, had lost its peg and then went insolvent. This is why I'm also very particular about the stable coins that I use. And the two I would recommend is gonna be Tether, USDT, or also just USDC. Now next we have exchange tokens. These are cryptocurrencies issued by a cryptocurrency exchange and are primarily used to provide benefits to two users for that exchange. Now, the two main exchange tokens that exist today are going to be BNB, Binance Coin, and Kronos, also known as CRO. Next here, we have meme coins. Now, this was a brand new category that came about in the last bull run. Now, meme coin is a type of crypto that is primarily driven by internet memes and social media attention rather than any inherent value or technological innovation. This type of cryptocurrency often has a strong online following and can experience rapid and extreme price fluctuations based on what's trending. Now, meme coins is not something that I personally go hold in for a long period of time. This is straight up gambling where you enter and you exit. For all the people that you hear making millions of dollars off of any 
one of these meme coins, there are even more people who have lost a lot more money. Be careful with meme coins. They will be on the rise once again. It is just the natural cycle of crypto because when people are making money, people want to make even more quick money and founders and people who are able to code then start making up these projects because it doesn't take a long time. A lot of people can make their own crypto token in a very short period. This year can result in a very dangerous, risky investment. Next, we have metaverse tokens. And before we can answer what this crypto means, we need to go over the definition of metaverse itself. Now, I actually made a TED talk on this a little while ago. If you guys want to go ahead and never watch that, it is on YouTube. But in short, the metaverse is a virtual reality space where you can step inside the internet and can connect with others. Now, the gaming industry is going to be the first step to the metaverse. And we've also seen games like Minecraft, Roblox, and Fortnite all currently offer the experience of living, shopping, selling, connecting, and earning online. Now, whether you hate it or love it, we are right now living in a world where we're slowly moving away from physical reality and going more into the virtual space. Now, if you're against that, you don't have to do anything with metaverse tokens, but if you see the future and you know Apple's releasing their VR headset too, and you wanna play on this, there are something called metaverse tokens that you can start buying. These here are generally tokens that are used within the virtual world. Now, since the concept of metaverse is still relatively new and even speculative to others, these tokens are also considered to be high risk. Now, the short existence of the metaverse projects is also a reason why some of these games haven't boomed yet, but we'll talk about the next crypto narrative and what this is setting itself up to be towards the end of this video. For now, there were some metaverse tokens that even in the last bull run, they were heating up significantly. And three of the largest ones by market cap are Decentraland, Sandbox, and Axie Infinity. Now, NFTs. Ooh, I've made a lot of videos about NFTs. I've been a first mover within the NFT space where we got into it many, many, many years ago, back when it was still just an idea of what it could be. Now, if you don't know, NFTs are a type of digital asset that represent ownership for a unique item or piece of content using blockchain technology. Think of these as a digital certificate. Each NFT is different and it cannot be replaced by anything else, hence why they're called non-fungible tokens. Now, I need to mention that NFTs are not cryptocurrencies, but they do share some similarities and both utilize blockchain technology. The main difference here between NFTs and crypto is the non-fungible principle and the purpose that they serve. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum are all fungible, meaning each each unit is the same as every other unit, but with NFTs, they are all supposed to be unique in its own. Now, I was getting heavy into the NFT market in the last bull run. I am still very bullish in the next bull run that NFTs are going to rise again. What we saw in the last rise of the bull run were PFPs, also known as personal profile pictures. This is where you'd buy an NFT of a bored ape where people know, okay, wow, that's like the Louis Vuitton of NFTs and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And for that person to use it as their profile picture, they are within the space. They know what they're doing, or they just simply have a lot of money. Now, in order to buy an NFT, you need to use Ethereum or one of the other newer currencies like DAO. Just like how you can buy crypto using an exchange, you can also do something similar where you can buy it with the Coinbase NFT platform or even going on OpenSea.io. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm still personally bullish on NFTs, even though these got rammed, like completely wiped out in this past bear market. The reason though, why I think think NFTs are going to make a comeback is simply because you're going to need NFTs in order to fit the narrative of what we see coming up with a lot of these other projects in development. Now, ladies and gents, if you want to learn more about these cryptocurrencies, including the top 20 largest projects, we have a full PDF guide I'm going to give you guys free access to. I'm also going to be giving you free access to the crypto key terms. I'll have a link down below in the description if you want to go ahead and access that. And I'll also be giving you access to this entire PowerPoint slide that I'm using for this video here. If you want to pick it up, just drop me your email and we'll have it sent to you in an instant. All right, so in this section here, we're going to go into more detail about everything you need to know regarding crypto wallets and how to use crypto exchanges. More specifically, I'm going to be talking about how you can buy crypto properly. We'll then discuss the differences between a hot wallet versus a cold storage wallet and explain what they even are. I'll go over the different types of crypto exchanges that exist. We're going to be talking about the difference between a centralized exchange versus a decentralized exchange 
And then I'll also show you how I maximize my wallet and my crypto to have the most amount of protection possible. After this entire section, I'm then gonna go over how much money I've been holding in one of my crypto exchanges. It's actually been doing pretty well in the last few weeks. We'll also go over how you can buy crypto properly, how you can transfer your funds, how you can set up reoccurring buys and do it where you're not spending additional costs in those transaction fees. So to begin, if you wanna buy, store, trade, invest, or do any type of transaction regarding crypto, you need to utilize generally a crypto exchange first, and this is gonna be a centralized exchange. Now, crypto exchange is a platform where buyers and sellers can trade crypto. These exchanges function similarly to a traditional stock exchange, but deal specifically with digital currencies instead of stocks. Anytime you are using a centralized exchange, you are trusting in their service and security measures to manage your funds. From there, you can go ahead and transfer your crypto over to a crypto wallet. And this is where you're gonna have more flexibility on being able to buy different things like NFTs or putting your money into DeFi protocols or even being able to buy certain altcoins that may not be available on certain exchanges. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these centralized exchanges have to go through more heavy regulation versus those decentralized exchanges where they can pretty much hold any cryptocurrency. In order to get your money from a centralized exchange over into a decentralized exchange, usually you're placing it in a custodial wallet and the wallet is then transferring that over into what Ever you want it to go. So what is a crypto wallet? Well, it is literally exactly what it sounds like. Just imagine having a wallet, but this is gonna give you a digital address and you can have your wallet stored on different browsers, on your phone, on certain devices. Now, crypto wallet is gonna consist of a pair of keys. One is gonna be your public keys. The second is gonna be your private keys. So similar to your bank account number, you can go ahead and use your public key to receive and to send crypto. So if I were to Venmo you right now, I would say, hey, I need to know your phone number or your email address in order for me to send that money. In this case, if you want to go ahead and send crypto to someone else, you need to ask them what their public key address is going to be. Now, the private key address is something that should be kept in secret. It should never be shared. And this here is what you're going to use in order to be able to log into different devices. So say as an example, I have my MetaMask and it's only here on this browser on this computer. If I wanted to go ahead and log into my MetaMask from a different location, I would need to know the private keys and I would need to know the password to it. So the security of your crypto wallet is crucial. And if anyone gains access to your private key, they can control your funds. And conversely, if you lose your private key, you pretty much lose access to your crypto. So there are essentially three different types of wallets. You have a hot wallet, which is like the MetaMask or any type of wallet that exists digitally. So if I go ahead and set up an account, say as an example with Coinbase, and they give me access to the Coinbase wallet, this here is classified as a custodial wallet. Next, we have hot wallets. This is pretty much what I just went over with the example of MetaMask. These are going to be wallets that you can sign up for very easily online, add it to your browser, or if you go on the app store, you, sometimes you're going to be able to see hot wallets listed there. So custodial wallet is where a third party service provider, such as a cryptocurrency exchange or online wallet platform manages and controls the private keys on your behalf. So when you create an account with a certain exchange, you're able to send that crypto over into those different accounts where it's being held on is going to be the custodial wallet. Now these custodial wallets, you pretty much don't have to do anything in setting it up. You get it as a byproduct for when you create an account with that particular exchange. Now, on the other hand, you have a hot wallet. You're going to have a bit more ownership over this just because a company isn't managing it. And with a hot wallet, it's pretty much like the MetaMask wallet that I just went over. With an app like MetaMask, you can go ahead and download it off the internet and then add it to your browser of choice. Now, hot wallets are connected to the internet and they're actively used for managing and transacting with other cryptocurrencies. These here are convenient. It's user friendly. It's easy to set up. It is completely free to get one as well. Now, the one disadvantage of a hot wallet is the fact that they do tend to get hacked pretty often. After this, we have cold storage wallets. Now, cold storage wallet is considered to be one of the most secure ways for you to hold your asset. Now, these here are going to be physical devices that look similar to USB drives. I got a variety of different cold storage wallets, and usually these companies have different tiers. So if you want to have the one with the brightest LED screen and the most capability, usually it's going to be a couple hundred bucks versus the most basic one. It's not going to feel as good. Sometimes it's a little plastic and flimsy, but they still get the job done. Now, the advantage of a cold storage wallet is that 
Like I said, it's the most secure option for your crypto and you are in full control of your private crypto keys. The disadvantage with this is the fact that if you're making everyday transactions, you have to go ahead and punch in your own personal code every single time and you need to have your device on hand. If you're someone who's day trading, you obviously do not want to do that from a cold storage wallet because even every time you send and transact crypto from that exchange, you're paying that additional fee. The main times you want to use a cold storage wallet is if you have a large sum of crypto that you know you're not moving and you're holding on to dear life for and you just want to tuck it away. Just like with a cold storage wallet, anytime you purchase one of these devices, they're going to have a full tutorial and pamphlet on what you need to do in order to get started. Generally, they are very easy. You just connect it, you get a wallet address and wherever you're currently holding your crypto, say it's on an exchange like Coinbase, you then go ahead, you copy the wallet address you get on the cold storage device and all you simply do is just send it over from your exchange over into the device and it's going to be chilling in there. Now that here leads into the definition of what a crypto exchange is. And this is just straight up guys. A crypto exchange is used to buy, sell and trade cryptocurrencies. But more particularly, there are going to be two main exchanges. We mentioned this earlier. It's going to be a centralized exchange or a decentralized exchange. Now centralized exchanges are going to operate under the authority of being a real company. So examples of this Coinbase, Binance, there's going to be a few more that I'm not going to mention here because they ended up going under in the last bear market. But you guys are going to have the idea here. Anytime you use a centralized exchange, you do have to go through a mandatory KYC process. You also have to do this when you are working with the stock exchange. And this here is just a law that's been around for as long as I remember where you're inputting your own personal information so that there's going to be less instances of money laundering happening in the world. Now, decentralized exchange is going to operate without a central authority, and they allow users to trade directly from their crypto wallets. Decentralized exchanges rely solely on smart contracts on the blockchain to facilitate the peer to peer trading between users. Now, decentralized exchange is usually meant for people who are, you know, a few years into crypto. They already have an idea of what altcoins are. They've been here within the space. Oftentimes, you don't see many new users who just hear about crypto automatically start trading into DEXs. But that's also because most people don't know about them and they don't know how easy it actually is. Now, centralized exchanges are going to be the easiest and the most user friendly out of everything. This is going to be a, a bit of a tear down just because of the connection aspect. But once you're on there, I'd say it'd be hard for you to get lost and to navigate through some of these DEXs. If you guys want to check any of them out, the most popular ones are Uniswap, something that we covered earlier. You also have SushiSwap and PancakeSwap. So knowing all that, how do I maximize my wallet and my crypto exchange? Because I have crypto in many different wallets across different exchanges. And what I've learned though, is just having a balance seems to be the best. So long-term holdings, put on a cold storage wallet, tuck it away, keep it safe. And and if I have any altcoin positions or NFTs that I know I'm not going to be moving and trading often, I'd consider actually moving that over to the cold storage wallet. Now, there are some exchanges that allow you to earn additional interest when you go ahead and stake that crypto. So those are the occasions where I would not move it onto my cold storage wallet. For any remaining crypto, I usually do keep it on a centralized exchange, but I make sure that I implement maximum security possible. So what this is going to look like is making sure you set up two-factor authentication, but don't do things like even adding your cell phone where you get the text message because quite frequently people do get SIM swapped. This is where someone is able to get access to your phone number. They get all the texts and they have access to all your information. So one of the best alternative ways to protect yourself through two-factor authentication is either through the authenticator app that only you have access to on a separate device or using something like a physical security key. Now the physical security key that I use is a YubiKey. This here's a camera memory card. It's not actually the device, but that YubiKey actually requires for me to plug it into a computer anytime I'm trying to log in on a separate device. Now, if I am actively trading, I will move my funds over into a hot wallet like my MetaMask or even my Coinbase wallet, but I don't like to put a lot of money on there just because they do end up tending to get hacked the easiest and most frequently out of all the different methods that I've talked about. Now, remember my story of when I invested into Bitcoin at 20 years old? Well, that was about seven years ago and the platform I had used back then was Coinbase and it's still what I would recommend now. Now at this point, you probably know, but a video like this takes almost a whole month to put together with my team. To be able to publish something of this much value it requires us to pull back on our ordinary uploading schedule and to make up for that loss, we've gone ahead, reached out to Coinbase who agreed to happily sponsor this portion of the video. So if you are looking for an exchange to use and you haven't signed up for one, check out Coinbase listed down below. Currently, they have a sick welcome bonus offer promotion for new applicants where if you 
use my link down below. They'll hook you up with up to $200 in free crypto and just getting started and up to $400 cash and free rewards. Now, out of all the exchanges that I've used, and trust me, I've used almost every single one of them to exist, Coinbase is by far the easiest one. They support a wide variety of cryptocurrencies that they're continuing to add on a regular basis. They're also considered to be one of the largest and most reputable exchanges in the world. They're also FDIC insured and they are a publicly traded company. This happened back in April of 2021. And while being a publicly traded company doesn't inherently make them more secure or safer, but because they are publicly traded, usually these companies are subject to more stringent regulatory requirements and oversight by other regulatory bodies, such as the US Securities and Exchange Commission and more. On top of that, when you're a public company, a lot of your finances need to be posted regularly and publicly, and everything needs to be disclosed. So if you ever worry about a company not having the funds, or if you're worried about what they might be doing with your money, Coinbase's transparency far exceeds many other companies that I've encountered in the past. Now, on top of that, Coinbase has a ton of different passive earning opportunities on over 100 different assets. They make crypto taxes easy. I'll show you guys a bit more about that soon. Coinbase also has some of the most competitive fees. I know that this was an issue before, but we'll go over some of the different tools that you can take advantage of now to cut down on those fees as well. Even within this past year, Coinbase has continued to add different softwares and programs, including NFTs. And even recently, they have their own hot wallet. So in this section here, let's go over then all that I've talked about. I want to make sure you have the full details on how when you sign up, you get that $200 and getting started. We're going to go over how you can make your first crypto trade. We're going to talk about how you can earn passive rewards through staking. And then we're also going to be going over Coinbase's advanced trading feature. All right. So the first step here, make sure that you go ahead and open our link down below in the description of this video. I also have it down below pinned as the top comment. On that first page, depending on mobile or on a website, this is what it should look like. You'll notice it says get up to $200 for getting started. If we go ahead and click on this, we can see the additional terms. To get started, it's actually very simple. You go ahead and put your first name, your last name, your email address, and your password. Once you go ahead and you do that, go ahead and create that free account. Once you have done that, you're going to get a verification email sent over to the email that you've inputted onto Coinbase. All right, so once you've completed those steps, you're then going to want to complete the KYC. And after that, you should have now full access to your Coinbase account. Now, I'm currently logged into my own account, and I want to just walk you through some of the basic features. First of all, on the home screen, if you click on your balance, you're going to be able to see the full history of your crypto portfolio. And like I mentioned, I had about 776 bucks back in 2018 on this account. We had the rise of the bull market. My crypto came crashing down, but slowly we have rebuilt up almost closing in on some of the previous levels. With my portfolio here, even in the last week, we're still up a pretty decent amount, about $20,000. Now to go ahead and buy crypto, it's super simple. On the top right hand of your screen, you're gonna see the word transfer. You click on that and you have four different options, to send crypto, to receive crypto, or to deposit cash and withdraw cash. The first step you wanna take here is depositing some cash. Coinbase has a wide variety of different payment methods. You could use PayPal, you could watch wire transfer, direct deposit in, or even just connect your bank account. I think connecting a bank account is the best and smoothest ways to go. Uh, this is where they're going to use Played to effortlessly connect you. You just log into your bank account using this, and then they're automatically going to be synced up. After completing that process, you're then going to be able to see your bank account pop up here. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to just toss in $1,000 from my checking account, and then I'm just going to click Add Cash now. Coinbase is also going to tell me there uh, when it's available, and from here, once I've completed that, I'm going to go ahead and refresh my page and see an updated balance of that $1,000 getting added in. Now, the next step in buying crypto is actually very simple, but I want to show you a few different ways just to make sure that you guys are not overspending in these fees. So obviously you have your buy and sell here. I can buy up to $3,500 worth of Bitcoin. So if I put $1,000, it's going to buy $1,000 worth of Bitcoin at its current price. If I preview buy here, you'll notice that my fee would normally be $14.68, but I actually get it completely for free. The way I did that was signing up for a program called Coinbase One. Now, Coinbase One is going to offer you a ton of benefits. One of those is zero traded fees on up to $10,000 a month. Now, Coinbase One allows you to pay them $30 a month, but if you are going to pay more in fees, I believe the ROI is there, but you just need to do the math for yourself. On top of that, this is also going to give you access to over a million dollars in eligible reimbursement off the chance that the funds in your account get stolen. All right, so I've been using Coinbase One for a pretty good 
amount of time, but if you didn't want to do this, you also actually have one more option. Going into Coinbase, clicking on more, go on advanced trade. From here, click on advanced. So open up advanced trade and you're going to go ahead and see the Coinbase order form and a whole different look. Now, this is not meant for beginners. This is a little bit more on the advanced level side. If you trade futures, options, if you wanna do leverage, this is where you'll have access to. Now, what I wanna show you here is the fact that you can still easily buy crypto. I'm gonna go ahead and put a USD dollar amount of, again, $1,000. Currently, Bitcoin's price action is changing. This is the order book of all the sales that are getting placed and all the buys. And if I initiate a limit price, this means when Bitcoin hits the price of 43,916 bucks, then it will execute. Now, if I put in a market order, it's not going to give me the best price in the world, but it's just going to buy at the current price that it's around at. You'll notice by going even through just the advanced feature, I'm actually paying a fee of just $8 compared to the fee of $13 to $14 from before. Before. Now, the fees on advanced trade work a little bit differently. By opening up the tab here, you'll actually be able to see exactly how the fees work. So this here works off the principle called make or taker. Uh, we're not going to go into full detail about it, but pretty much you're just going to be able to see in how much volume that you trade the fees that you pay. Pretty much the more volume you trade, the less you're going to pay over time. Now, obviously, I can still buy crypto completely for free because I have the Coinbase One account, so I'm not going to do this here. But this here is just another simple example for you to buy crypto at a discounted price. But that that right there was just another example for you to be able to buy crypto with a discount on those fees. Now going into Coinbase once again, I'm going to turn off dark mode. I'm going to click buy. I'm going to put $1,000. I can preview the order and it would be as simple as just pressing buy now. Now you can also do something where you buy the same amount every single week just by enabling this tab. If you don't want to do that, it's completely fine. You could also do that over here. So go into more, go into reoccurring buys and you'll see one-time order. And from here, if you go into reoccurring buys, you can set it from daily, weekly, first and 15th of the month, or just every month. If you want a dollar cost average into the market consistently, you don't want to think twice about it. You could put a hundred dollars every week into Bitcoin. You preview the buy, make sure your account is linked. And from there, you'd be good to go. Now it's as simple as that in buying crypto with Coinbase. You also have many different cryptocurrencies you have access to. So Ethereum, XRP, Solana, and oftentimes they work in the same way. If I wanted to go ahead and buy Solana, I can still pay with my USDC balance or I can go direct from my checking account. Previously, you would actually go ahead and have to buy things like USDT or a stable coin first before being able to buy the crypto, but you'll see a lot of these companies are making it even more easy than ever before. One last feature I wanna show you is the Coinbase staking. So you'll see on my screen, I've made about 3,500 bucks passively on an average rate of earning three 0.26% from my investment. The way that's split up is I've made about 1600 bucks from just leaving my Ethereum staked and I've made about 1400 bucks with an 8% APR with my Cosmos Atom crypto. Now say I wanted to go ahead and unstake my crypto, it will tell me the unstaking period is going to make me wait about 11 days before I can do that. Every crypto has a different unstaking period. If I take a look and I want to unstake all of my Atom, it's going to tell me I have about 25 days before I can release it from that. So if you know you're going long and you don't need this money anytime soon, or this could be another way for you to hold yourself accountable because you start taking emotions out knowing that your funds are locked up for a certain period of time. This is one tool that I definitely wouldn't sleep on. Now, if you're actively trading, obviously you don't want to stake any of your crypto. But like I said, if you're going long term with some of your assets, why not earn additional interest for free on top of it? All right. So in this section of the video, let's go over how you can properly research different cryptocurrencies so you don't end up buying something that ends up tanking and being just a complete flop. In this section, we're going to be covering the fundamental analysis you do behind a crypto. We'll talk about technical analysis and we'll We'll talk about what makes certain crypto projects valuable and how you can find emerging projects on the up. So if you've ever traded any money within the stock market, then I'm sure you've heard of fundamental and even technical analysis before. These here are going to be two primary ways that investors or traders make buying decisions. Now, fundamental analysis in crypto is a little bit different than what you would expect from the world of stocks. This method here is evaluating an asset's intrinsic value by examining factors such as financial performance, 
determines industry conditions, economic indicators to assess its investment potential. Now, the key difference here between stocks and crypto is that with stocks, you're looking at the finance report, the financial health, the earning reports, the market share, the market cap, and the company's plan for growth. With crypto, it's a little different. You're going to be analyzing the blockchain technology, the network, the security, the adoption, the community support, the tokenomics, and the utility of the specific crypto. Now, by the way, tokenomics refers to the economics of a cryptocurrency, and it pretty much encompasses everything related to the token's creation, management, an overall economic model. If you want to go ahead and perform thorough fundamental analysis in your research on a cryptocurrency, go ahead and first read the white paper to understand the purpose and use case of that crypto. From there, you want to go ahead and follow the project. See if you can follow different members of the team on social media, see what they're posting, see what they're following, see how many followers they have. From here, you want to analyze the team's track record and their ability to deliver on goals. Now, Twitter is going to be huge. Twitter is where crypto pretty much lives on, and you can find a lot of what they call called alpha on there. Alpha is just like the inside scoop, the inside T. It's like data points that you'd get. And Twitter's real important too, because you can see how much engagement a certain project is getting. And you can see some of the people that may be following that project that has credibility from different wins or different analysis that they've posted that allowed them to blow up on that platform. Now, from there, you want to go ahead and research a project's market position and see if there are different competitors and how they would differentiate themselves from them. Last but not least, you want to evaluate the strength and the activity of the community that's always going to be huge behind any project. Now, this type of analysis usually takes a lot of time and sometimes you can get very in-depth on it. And when you're going through things like the white paper and then it goes into the technicalities of the actual crypto, it can go over many people's head. So shortly, I'll go over a lot more easier processes that you can still find good potential bangers in. Before we do that, let's talk about technical analysis. So technical analysis or in short TA is the study of charts and trading volume to make predictions about future price movements and identify potential buying or selling opportunities in financial markets. If you ever see people with like all the charts and the lines and the candlesticks, that's what TA is all about. Generally, people who trade off of TA are more short-term traders rather than investors. Personally, for me, I'm someone who likes to go long on my positions. I prefer the fundamentals behind crypto, uh, but I've also realized the importance of still using a hybrid method where you use technical analysis to get a better entry on the short term. Now, if you want to get started with technical analysis as a complete beginner, you're going to need to learn about the basic different technical indicators and understand support and resistance levels and the basics of a TA chart. Now, I believe one of the best ways to learn TA is through a community. There's a lot of free resources online, but nothing beats like being in live streams or just being able to see the potential benefit of doing something along these lines. Now, in our membership group, Kaizen, which we'll also have linked down below, we have different TA analysts and traders that have been here within the space for combined experience of over a decade. Now, my analysts and coaches are posting wins every single day. So if you guys want to have a chance to check it out, I also have a link to that resource down below as well. As I mentioned earlier, though, Let's talk more about how you can find emerging projects. So one, you want to start using a crypto tracking website. The most popular options are CoinMarketCap and CoinGecko because you can filter through hundreds of thousands of different coins based on the criteria you're looking for. And they also provide plenty of information about the project to begin your research. So to do this, just hop on one of their sites. I'm on CoinMarketCap.com right now. And you could even see different categories. So if you want to invest into AI or BRC20, which we'll talk about later, or even the gaming, you'll see different cryptocurrencies within this niche. Now, if you want one that's new with a smaller market cap, you can organize it and sort it by descending within this category. CoinMarketCap also has different categories here. So if I want to click on the top gainers and losers, you can use that to do your research or even things like new cryptos that are recently added. This will at least give you a start. And with a lot of these more established cryptocurrencies, you'll actually be able to see social media followings. You'll also be able to see different news articles coming up and you can see different data points regarding their market cap or even how their price has been trending on the charts. Now, the next method in being able to start your research is monitoring the portfolio of top crypto venture capitalist firms. You can start this by just going on Google, searching up top crypto VC firms, and then from there, see what they're looking to invest in. So to do this, it just was a simple Google search. I see Coinbase Ventures is on here, AU21 Capital, Pantera Capital. I know Pantera is actually pretty solid. What you would then want to do is go ahead, find their website, look into what they're investing in. From here, you can see things like their early stage tokens. You can invest with them. You can also get investor reports. 
You can also even see their portfolio. Here's just a list of all these different cryptocurrencies that you could also buy as an investor. Now, the reason I like this method of research is because VC firms are gonna have some of the best people with some of the most experience and an unfair advantage because of all the connections and what they know. You may not even have to do all the research we talked about. You can go ahead and just pick up a few of their crumbs here and there, but that could still lead to some tremendous amount of wins. Now, the third way to find emerging projects is through on-chain analytic firms. So on-chain analysis, is simply put just the use of blockchain data for purposes ranging from trading to research. So on-chain analysis allows you to use the data that you would get from a blockchain because remember, everything is transparent. You could see all the transactions happening. You could see all the money coming in. And this is very valuable data to get a head start on knowing what crypto you might want to buy. A glass note is going to be one of the biggest leading on-chain analysis platforms. This is gonna take a little bit more work. I would not recommend this for a complete beginner, but this is also gonna be another valuable tool if you ever want to expand the way that you research some of these emerging tokens. Now, the fourth method of doing additional research is taking advantage of something called total value locked or knowing just how much money is on some of these projects and just doing a simple comparison using tools like DeFi Llama. Now, this is a tool that we used a lot in the last bull run and pretty much you can get an overview of how much money is locked within some some of these different altcoins. As you can see, Lido has $21 billion locked and these DeFi protocols will have money for lending or collateral, whatever it is. But you can see just how much money might be on there. To get an edge on the market, if you notice that some of these different cryptocurrencies may have a huge TVL, but their market cap does not reflect the amount of money that is locked in here, that's where you're gonna be able to get an edge on knowing what project you might wanna buy in. In the last bull run, we actually saw a trend. This happened with Avalanche in particular, which is another cryptocurrency called AVAX, where the TVL was warming up. It was starting to accumulate a lot of funds before we actually saw the explosion in that price. So it's not always going to be that, you know, if there's a high TVL that the cryptocurrency is automatically going to go and soar to the roof. But from my experience, this has given me a good guidance on knowing at least where I can confirm or start the research that I had. Now, just as a disclaimer, investing in any early stage crypto project is always going to be very risky. So just approach it with extra caution. In this next chapter here, let's talk all about building your own crypto portfolio. So a quick disclaimer before we get into building out a crypto portfolio, look, crypto should not be a majority of your entire investment portfolio. Even for me, I like spreading it out between real estate, stocks, and other safer investments. This is because crypto at the end of the day is still a lot more volatile than what most investors are used to. And if you've gone through both a crypto bull and bear market cycle, then you'll know firsthand that it's possible to see your portfolio drop by 60 to 80% or more. But on the off chance, you are able to see even higher upsides of two to five X in returns. Now, none of that, by the way, is promised. How much you make in this market depends solely on how you move as an investor. I just want to always make that disclaimer that you should never be investing all of your money and putting all your eggs in just one basket, because at the end of the day, diversification is still going to be key just in the case that we see another downside. Now, that being said, if you are going long on crypto, I'm still so bullish over the long term. And for me, my horizon is not just one year, two year, three years of holding. It's five year holdings. It's 10 year holdings. It's even 15 years from where crypto might be at compared to today. So that being said, which cryptocurrencies should you invest in? So what I've come to realize is that every investor has their own goals and preference. So the answer to this question may differ for every single person watching this video. To make a decision though, you need to know what your exact risk risk tolerance may be. From here, you also want to get full clarity on what your goals as an investor are. If you're trying to simply capitalize from the long-term upward trajectory of crypto, then I'd say you're more better off investing in low-risk cryptocurrencies with a few medium-risk tokens sprinkled in. Now, if your goal is to find the next 100x crypto project, then you might be looking at more high-risk, low-cap projects that have higher chances of failure, but allow you more room to grow. Regardless of that risk tolerance, I still recommend having a diversified portfolio with just a mix of these assets. So if you're considered to be more of a low risk investor, I would say that you're looking at Bitcoin, Ethereum, and maybe even XRP. As you know, XRP won the regulatory lawsuit, but you cannot beat just looking at Bitcoin as your primary cryptocurrency because they are the largest in market cap. At the end of the day, I believe Bitcoin still is going to be one of the safest digital assets just because of how large the market cap is. Now, if you are a bit more of a medium risk investor, you may want to look at some of these medium risk cryptocurrencies, and these are going to be the ones that are different 
different altcoins still within usually the top 100. And as an example, I'd say it'd be Solana, Cardano, Chainlink, Tron, Polygon, Polkadot, Avalanche, Stellar, Cosmos, and Monero. Now you don't need to have all of these cryptocurrencies in your portfolio. You could have just two or three of them to spread it out. My purpose of revealing this to you is so that you at least have some clarity on what a medium risk crypto might look like. Now from there, we have your high risk cryptocurrencies and these are pretty much every crypto I'd consider that's not within the top 100. Now my list of high risk cryptocurrencies are definitely going to include though the meme coins, small caps, and micro caps. Now small cap cryptocurrencies have a market cap of less than $500 million generally and the micro cap cryptocurrencies have a market cap of less than $100 million. Now in a bear market, this number fluctuates. In a bull market, it actually rises up even more just because there's so much money going back into the crypto markets. But for at least the purpose of just getting a base standard, I'd say this is a safe number. Now some examples of high risk cryptos, Shiba Inu, I'd consider that still to be higher risk. I know that's a little bit more subjective, but just any other meme coin that we've seen coming up within the past few years uh, that was not able to break into the top 100. Now real quick, here are some of the key points from this previous lesson. When you're building your crypto portfolio, always diversify in everything you do. Keep crypto just as a minor portion of your overall investment portfolio and don't risk more money than you can afford losing. For me, my general crypto portfolio would look as something like having about 60% of my funds into Bitcoin or Ethereum, then allocating about 25 to 30% of it in medium risk coins, and then allocating another 10 to 15% in those high risk coins. Now, the more comfortable you are with risk, the more you can obviously allocate your portfolio towards the medium or high risk coins. But at the end of the day, you got to just do whatever you're most comfortable with. There are some people called Bitcoin maximalists that believe that Bitcoin is the one and only crypto and there's nothing else after that. And they would rather put 100% of their net worth in there. Now, in this chapter, we're going to be covering crypto taxes just for U.S. citizens. So if you happen to be from another country, feel free to just skip to the next chapter. So for the rest of my people, crypto taxes here in the U.S. are a bit more complicated and the IRS treats cryptocurrencies as property for tax purposes. What this means here is that you pay taxes on crypto if you sell or use your crypto in a transaction. And this is because you trigger something called a capital gain or a capital loss if its market value has changed from the time of purchase versus the time of use or selling. And these are profits from a crypto asset held less than a year that are taxed at the same rate at whichever income tax bracket you're in. By the way, any losses can be used to offset income tax by a maximum of $3,000 and any further losses can be carried forward. There's something called tax loss harvesting. If you've taken a big L within one year, but you expect yourself to make a lot of money in the next year, you can realize a lot of those losses and then avoid paying taxes on the future gains that you make because of the rule that the IRS has set where your losses can be carried over into the future. Now, obviously when it comes to taxes too, I'm not an expert. I'm not a CPA certified person or accountant. This is all that I've learned from my own accountant. So if you guys have any questions, don't rely on this specifically consult with your own tax professional. Now, on the other hand of that, one thing, that I love about holding crypto for a long period of time is that you get taxed at a long-term capital gain rate if you hold that asset for longer than one year, which is much lower at zero to 15 or even 20%, depending on your tax bracket and if you are an individual or if you are married. Now, when it comes to crypto, there are actually a lot of different taxable events that can happen. So obviously selling your crypto, but people don't realize that if you exchange one crypto for another, that incurs another taxable event. Now, on top of that, you also have to get taxed on any time you earn rewards on your crypto for anything that's staked or if you're even earning things like a free airdrop. So pretty much from all this, I've realized over the last few years is that if you are manually inputting all the times that you're doing something with crypto or something that you've received for free, I'd be surprised if there's anyone in the world that could do this within a short period of time without making a mistake. So knowing that, I make sure that I just use software that's available. Now, software is getting even more better over time. For me, I've been using Coinly for the past few years, and that's because they'll sync everything up. They'll make sure that you're not forgetting anything. Uh, but on top of that, I will stack that with using a tax professional or a CPA, at least for my books. And generally, I'll avoid the third way, which is manually inputting uh, all my tax accountable events that happen within that year. If you're day trading, find a way for you to make sure you're on top of your taxes. A lot of people think profit is pure profit, but at least here, if you're living in the States, you're going to be paying a decent amount to the tax man. It's really unfortunate because if you mess up your taxes, the penalty is like, okay, jail time. 
or okay, here's a huge fine. As long as you know about some of the softwares that exist, I'd consider yourself to be still above a majority of the pack. There are also gonna be people who say, oh, Brian, I don't think I'll ever get caught for not paying my taxes on crypto. Look, that could be the case. You could be absolutely right, but that is something that I personally would never risk. There are articles within the past year where the IRS has talked about hiring even more people. The IRS wants to find ways where they can track all these crypto purchases. And anytime you make an account with an exchange, the exchange has to send data over to the IRS. And anytime your social security number does not add up with the amount of gains that you might have underreported, that's when you could end up being in some trouble. Now in this chapter, let's go over the five major tips that you need to know before starting out. So tip number one, start your crypto journey in a simple way. A lot of the times I've seen people who get so overwhelmed within the space because they immediately want to jump into all these complicated things. Look, yeah, if you go into certain DeFi protocols and you're using on-chain analysis to find anomalies between some of the best cryptos that have the highest TVL, like, yeah, you can overwhelm yourself instantly. I think simplicity is the key. It never hurts to know a lot about what you're investing into, but in the beginning, I'd say just simplify everything. Start by opening up a free account with an exchange. Start slowly from there. Get more comfortable over time. Don't rush this process. And the fact that you're actually watching this video till the end, you've pretty much just downloaded multiple, multiple years of experience that people don't get. So from that, I just want to say, keep things still simple until you get comfortable. Don't go full out into futures or leverage trading and things like that. Start slow, work your way up. And it never even hurts if you want to trade with paper money, which is not real money and see how you can do. The second biggest tip I have is to make sure you join a community. Now you don't have to join my community. I think we do have one of the best communities available out here too, but just find people that you know in real life, find Facebook groups or telegram groups or WhatsApp groups that are not scams. Always make sure that's the case, but you want to find people who you can look up to, who can guide you and also a community of people that are within your same level. One way that you can hold yourself accountable too is just by having people that you can talk to closely that you can trust. If it weren't for a couple of my friends that we could dive deep into the whole NFT market in, I don't know if I would have been able to have made the money that I did and learn as much as I did at the time. Community is huge in whatever you're doing and it's gonna give you a lot more clarity than if you were to tackle it alone. If you have an Instagram, it doesn't hurt to post a few stories about you you know, making a few trades, having a few wins, or wanting to learn more from others and just putting up a group chat. You'd be surprised that little group chat you made from just that one post could end up being your closest friends for the entirety of your life. And you guys might be the ones popping bottles on the yacht when you guys take off. Tip number three, make a plan to achieve your goals and stick to it. A lot of people enter the crypto markets not knowing what they want to do. And sometimes people end up just flip-flopping based on their emotions and they end up losing a lot more money than if they were to just stick with a plan and saw it through. If you want to make a lot of money, have a plan, okay? Have a plan for First, write it down, type it out in your notes, but know what you want to do, know your goals, know what you think, know the exact strategies and steps where you can build towards that. One way to help build your goals is literally going on Twitter, guys. You're going to be able to come across a lot easier, different people's strategies, their threads, what they do to find some of the biggest winners. And I definitely recommend that you take advantage of Twitter. If you're planning to be in the crypto space for a long period of time, be on Twitter, know how to make lists, know how to follow the right accounts, because this is also going to give you huge, huge advantage in making the best plan for yourself. Number four, be skeptical. If you want to try out a new crypto service or work with someone in crypto, do your research and always take caution. There's a lot of scams happening here within the space. There's a lot of bad projects, bad actors here. And if you want to be around here, for a long period of time without losing money to just vicious scams that are going on, you want to make sure that you have a level of skepticism in what you do. So if anyone ever DMs you, be careful. If anyone ever like adds you to a group, be careful of that too. Do your full research and verify that all the links that you're clicking on are legit. Tip number five, and that is to take profit. Do not be greedy. In the last bull run, I've seen so many people making this mistake where they kept saying, okay, Dogecoin's going to hit a dollar. I'm not going to sell until a dollar and two dollars and five dollars. And it just kept going on. If you really want to succeed as an investor, you need to learn to take profits and to not get greedy. If you're already up, you're already up. You're already making some money. There's no need for you to get so greedy that you end up not being able to cash out anything. I know people in real life who have had the opportunity to make millions of dollars, but they were not able to close on it. In the off chance you get close to making whatever goal you had set from our previous tip, make sure you follow along with it because there will be more cycles. But there is one thing for sure. 
as a bull cycle grows, a bear cycle follows. We have not yet seen a continuous bull cycle that lasts for a very long period of time where everyone is constantly making money because in the world of crypto and investing, for someone to make money, they are buying it off of someone who is selling and vice versa. So in this market, don't be afraid to sell too early. I know FOMO can get the best of you when you see it riding a bit more up, but it never is a bad thing or a loss for you to make money and to close it out. So knowing all that, you guys should be like, super set, but I want to make sure you're super duper set. All right. And this is going to be going over all the crypto plays that I see panning out for the next upcoming bull run. Now, every bull run that we've seen in the past seems to be have driven from a large narrative. In 2017, I believe the big narrative there was initial coin offerings called ICOs. They're very similar to an IPO. Like there's all this hype when a new stock is coming out on the market and everyone wants to buy in. That was the trend. In late 2019 and early 2020, the big narrative I noticed back then was the alternative layer ones and NFTs. Those are going to be your altcoins. Those are going to be things like your Ethereum killers that were starting to come up. And this is where in 2021, we then had NFTs and meme coins making the big boom. Now, some of the big narratives that I believe coming up is going to be GameFi. This here is a word that means the integration of gaming, blockchain, and finance. Think about it like this. Gaming is on the rise. We're seeing more kids, more adults, more money going into this space. We're seeing it getting live stream, college scholarships. I mean, all this crazy stuff happening. What we haven't seen yet is the ability for people to do something that they love, play games and make money. I believe this is going to be the next integration. And in making these games, it takes a few years at the minimum. I recently played the Spider-Man game. That was amazing. But I know even for the developers to put that together, it took them a very long time. I know GameFi is on the up. I know the previous bull run, it was getting worked on. So this is something that I am planning to make a position in. The next one here is going to be BRC20. So these are fungible tokens that are compatible with Bitcoin blockchain. When it comes to trading Ethereum, you're going to hear the term ERC20. That was the wave, the last bull run. I think BRC20 and Bitcoin compatible cryptocurrencies could be another narrative that I see huge potential in. Now, the next one is RWA or real world assets. These are tangible assets that exist in the physical world where now you're able to combine that with the utility of the crypto blockchain and NFTs. Examples of this is going to be using real estate, commodities, art, or even U.S. treasuries and finding a way for us to connect the world of the digital side of crypto versus the real world stuff of what we have. I think that right there is going to be a huge narrative that we see planning out. And I see that becoming even more mainstream for a lot of newer adopters getting into the space. And last but not least, I think the AI narrative is going to pop off. After reading many different studies and reports, the AI sector is only going to continue to grow. Right now, we've seen ChatGPT blow up in the last year. And I know that is just the beginning. There is going to be a blend between AI and crypto. We just don't know exactly how that's going to pan out just yet. But for whatever it's going to be, I see that being another potential narrative that can play out. So ladies and gents, that is going to be the full video right here. This was the longest video that I've ever made on YouTube. If you have made it till the end, First of all, I just want to say thank you because I know it takes a long time to sit through this. You might have had to spend a couple days watching through different bite-sized pieces, but I appreciate you guys for making it here. We talked about a lot of resources, and if you guys want to have access to it, everything will be linked down below. By the way, like I mentioned before, if you want to download this entire crypto PDF, I will send this to you completely for free in addition to a lot of the resources that we had, including the key terms and my own PDF of the top 20 different cryptocurrencies so that you can scroll through something and read it at your own leisure. Now, something I usually do is if you're a real one, because only the real ones make it to the end, only the dedicated, only my most loyal and handsome and beautiful looking followers are going to be watching this section here. If you are hearing my words right now, do me a favor and comment down below the word. I love Coinbase. Coinbase was huge alongside my journey. And I never even thought where I'd get to a position where the same exchange that first got me into crypto and has helped me make a lot of money is the same one that is now willing to work together with us. It's for real, just such a surreal real moment and so amazing. And I want you guys to show Coinbase the same amount of love that I'm also feeling. So comment that down below as well. If you guys want to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and on Instagram, I'll also have that link down below and make sure last but not least that you subscribe. We're going to continue to put out high value content just like this. And my goal here with this YouTube channel is to just impact your guys's life with all the best financial tools possible so that you can break out of poverty or whatever you're dealing with, just like I have before. Thank you all so much again for watching today's video. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys and I'll see y'all soon.